I'm Simon. Hello. Just to basically uh, just take you through what I'm going to show you is uh, a little bit of an agenda. So I'm going to start by changing of the homepage layout. Uh, I will then show you the SmartList Designer, um, which is included as part of GP2013. I'm not sure if any of you actually use SmartList Builder at the moment, um, which you pay for. This SmartList Designer is very similar and free. Uh, after that, I'll show you reconciling balances. Now, one of the features that's been available uh, for uh, a couple of versions now is the reconcile to GL function. Uh, and there's a couple of additional things that are now available in it. After that, I'll jump into the general ledger uh, and show you how to inactivate account codes with balances and reconciling the bank, which is actually part of the reconciling balances before one. Okay, uh, then linking off from there, showing you how to assign a printer at time of printing. One of the biggest problems we had before was not being able to choose a printer. Now you can. Then I'll move on to payables, uh, showing you how to set a default lookup on the creditors, how to assign uh, reporting services reports to maintenance windows, how to reprint uh, remittances for a historical window, uh, moving on to personal processing, how to enter tolerances, and how to enter prepayments on purchase orders. Then on to receivables. Okay, right. I'm going to jump straight into GP. Now I've already already logged into uh, GP. So uh, a moment. So one thing within 2013. Those of you who are already using GP and you have your homepage, you'll be familiar with it. But with 2013, there's a couple of additional things that you can do. One thing that's particularly good, and it's not just on the homepage, but it's also on the ledger pages as well. You can actually maximise and move your panes around to be in whichever particular place you so prefer. And I'll just show you on the financials as well. So I can move transactions over, set up over, so on and so forth. What you can also do when you're setting up your home page, you can actually say how many columns I would like to have. There we go. So the good thing is you can actually have you can actually show more on your individual home page. Do all of you uh, kind of use a fair bit of your home pages and that kind of stuff? They are quite handy. Okay, that's it. Quite good. So next, I'll move on to the smartest designer. Now this is actually uh, new. It's very good, very very user friendly, and and the, and the thought process behind it is that any smart list that you have at present that don't quite give you enough information, you can very, very simply create your own. So another good thing that the SmartList Designer has enabled is that when you open up SmartList on the full screen, you can actually hide the favorites on the left-hand side, which has been uh, one of the questions many people have asked over the years. So what you'll see within this particular SmartList, this is just my standard SmartList, what I have, I've created one, called supply backs. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete that and create it again just so you can see how easy it is. One of the biggest problems you have with GP is having an easy way of showing what the suppliers are and what their bank account details are within SmartList. Now this is obviously using one part of it, but what this could potentially be handy for is when you're doing your payment run and you want to be able to produce a list of all your uh, invoices due for payment and you want to be able to make sure that everything that is marked for backs has got full back details associated with them. So it saves you having to submit the backs report to the bank and then, then rejecting it. So I'm going to delete this. Okay, so I'm going to create a new smart list name, just call it backs details. Okay, so it's GP and you see you've got lots of them off any of the modules you have. And I want I want it to sit in my purchasing folder within SmartList. Get a list of my creditors and then link into my creditors that have got bank account details. So, under GP, under tables, under purchasing. If I scroll down, one of them will see is credits and master file. And I can tick that. But what I can actually do is I can filter which fields I want. So I don't want absolutely everything. I'm just going to have the vendor ID and vendor name. Back to the table that's got the backs details. 
to minimize that. There's my EFT fund master. So what I need to do is just join the two together. So I've got the fund master, got the vendor ID is equal to the creditor master vendor ID. Simple as that. And if I click execute, you'll see I've got all the fields on. So what I want to do is I want to take out a load of information. Bank name, let's see, bank branch, bank code, so on and so forth. There we go. So what you see, I've now got my bank account details, so on and so forth. So I click OK, and there it's automatically in smart list for me. Very, very simple to do. Actually, expand the use of smart list uh, to add additional things in that are specifically key to, to your particular business. Uh, my personal favourite is that. Makes it so much easier to see. So I'm just going to close smart list. Okay, right. I'm going to move on to uh, reconciling balances and I'll actually include within this part the reconciling the bank. So under financial, and I'm going to go to my routines. And one of the options I have is reconcile, reconcile to GL. Now this was available in GP2010 first off, but they've changed it now. And it's actually a little bit better how, how uh, they do it. Firstly, what it does is when you actually use this reconciliation tool, and basically all it will do is it will produce a list of general ledger transactions. And then next to it, whether you are doing a purchase ledger reconciliation, Next to it, it will produce a list of all the transactions that do or potentially don't match against the GL, potentially causing issues in reconciliation. What this will do is it will keep those records that you've done. So from a monthly rec perspective, you can keep one on a monthly basis so that you know every single month you've done your rec correctly and if any differences appear, you know what it says you can do payables management receivables management, inventory, and bank reconciliation, that's standard GP bank rec. I'll do purchase ledger. I'm going to find my purchase ledger control account. And if I had, for argument's sake, some, some organizations have a trade creditors account and other creditors account as well. You can actually add more than one code in there. What you then do is say, where do I want my specific Excel file that's created save to? And I'm just going to save onto the desktop. And I'm going to process. And there we go. What that will then do is it will produce a list of all the transactions which are potentially unmatched. So unmatched payables means that it's gone through the purchase ledger, but not hit the general ledger, potentially causing a mismatch. Alternatively, if I posted a journal to the control account that hadn't gone through the, the purchase ledger, it would appear on the right-hand side. And there's all the stuff to be matched off. So the benefit to that now is I then have a record saved somewhere. And when I next do my next purchase ledger management one, I have a reconciliation number two. And you can overtype that, for argument's sake, to be the current month, however you want to. So it's a good way of actually easily keeping hold of your monthly reconciliation routines. As I said, you can do it on purchase ledger, sales ledger, inventory transactions, and bank transactions. Now, what it primarily does is say anything that's gone through the subsidiary ledger and not hit the general ledger, or entered in the general ledger against the control account, but not entered into uh, the, the uh, the subsidiary ledger. Very handy, that one. Right, I'm going to move on to financials. Let's move my quick links back up. And I'm going to open up my account. Right. Uh, 
those of you who are on older versions of Dynamics GP, one of the, especially if you've been using the system a long time, one of the biggest problems is um, leftover account codes that were used five, six years ago that will appear on your trial balance and you couldn't do anything with because they have been used. Now, what you can do in 2013, you can inactivate any account code that has a balance. So, for argument's sake, what someone may have done is you've set up an account code that no longer is used, you've created a replacement, or more often than not, someone's created a code in error. What you can do is you can inactivate this, so it will no longer appear in the lists of account numbers, it won't appear on your trial balances, but it will still be there if you want it to. So it's very, very handy to make sure that the chart of accounts you're using is nice and clean. What I can do as well is if I wanted to print out this particular record, and whether it be this record or an inquiry or an edit list or anything along those lines, you've always been able to print. But what I can do is at point of entry, I can pick printer, and it will then ask me, rather than defaulting to, it will ask me which printer I would like to send it to. That's a very, very good addition. In addition to that, specifically on the account code window, I could add SRS reports. From big long list. And so what I then do is I could simply print the trial balance for that particular account code. My reporting service isn't working, isn't running, I do apologise. Which will then run <coughs> and run the TB for that particular for that particular code. Moving on to purchase ledger. Uh, now, in my experience over the years, uh, one thing a lot of people have asked me is, can I set my lookup to be how I want it to when I'm looking for a range of creditors. So, this is my creditor lookup. And normally, you have creditor ID and creditor name. Now, one thing that you may want to search on is by creditor class. So, what you can do is I can say, right, I want the class ID to be within my lookup, but I always want it to be this when I log in. So, what I can do is I can mark set as default view, so every time I do a lookup, whether it be in a, a maintenance window or an inquiry or a transaction window, it will automatically include class ID. I can very easily change that to be a different one. For argument's sake, if I wanted to do it on postcode, set as default, and there we have the postcode there. And that's in addition to the standard things you have in the lookups of being able to, to link it into smart list favourites and restrictions. <clears throat> Another thing that's new which is quite handy is you can attach default documents, now whether that be uh, an agreement, some kind of contract, uh, anything you like, you can, need, you can attach it to static records and also transactions. So, you see you've got a paper clip top right hand side. You see I have, I can have a number of attachments, I'm just going to go into attach, and I've got a scanned image of an item that I buy from that particular credit. I'm going to click OK and you'll see now that my document is attached and that's called document attached. I can click on that and then preview it. And what it will actually do is it will show me what that particular document is. That is available on debtors, creditors, inventory items, which is particularly handy for, um, because when you actually put it for a sales transaction, which I'll show you in a short while, it will actually show you any attachments that that particular item you're selling or buying has. Good from a catalog perspective. Again, against the creditor, I can assign 
any number of reports that I may want to run. So if I want to add an aging report to that particular debt, uh, creditor, sorry, or summary, or just the straightforward age creditors report, I can add it from there, and it will run directly from that window with that creditor restriction automatic in place. From a processing perspective, once I've done my payment run and my back file has been created and my remittance form has been sent out, one thing you may find is that you want to reprint any remittance that has been sent out. So what you can do is, I'm just going to find a creditor who has had a payment. There we go. So this particular creditor has had a payment. I'm going to drill down. And you'll see down the bottom right hand side, I have a recreate check stub, which basically means recreate the remittance. So I'm going to recreate that. And if I have my Word template, it will recreate it in a Word template. I'm just going to just do the standard one that comes out of GP. And there we have my reprinted payment remittance. If you are on the purchase ledger and you need to void a payment that you put through, I'm just going to find that particular creditor. What you'll see is in my void historical window, I have a checkbox with void, and underneath that, I have a little marker to say whether that has been reconciled in the bank rec or not. That's purely and simply there for an indication to say, look, you've reconciled this item. Do you really want to void it? What you can also do is it has been reconciled you will be able to drill down to the bank reconciliation and see the reconcile number to make sure it has been reconciled correctly. It could be a duplicate, so on and so forth. So that's quite handy. From a purchase order processing perspective, I'm just going to put on a PO. What you'll see within the PO, if I pick an, a creditor item which has got a document attached to it, you'll see I have a paper clip there. So it will show me any attachment that particular purchase order, uh, purchase order item has. Or alternatively, if you've had a quote from a particular supplier for a purchase order over the phone, you can attach that to the particular purchase order you're putting through. Now, when putting on purchase orders and receiving against them, one thing you may want to do is be able to set tolerances. So what you can actually do is on receipting and invoicing, if you have a shortage or an overage, you can set a percentage to say, can I allow this? And if the over or under is, is outside that range, then it will not allow the full receipting and posting of that particular receipt and or invoice. Very, very handy. Another thing from the point of view of purchase orders, what you can now do is if you have made a prepayment against the purchase order, what you can do at point of entry, oops, sorry, you can enter the prepayment amount that you then you've made. What that will then do is automatically create a manual payment for you in the purchase ledger. I'm just going to assign a creditor to that particular item. So I'm buying 10 at 550 pounds. Against that, apologies. Against that particular five and a half thousand pound purchase order, I've actually made a deposit of a thousand. There's a password which you, which you can set, and once you pop that in, it will actually say how has it been made? Is it uh, a part of your payment run? Was it part of a manual payment? Which is realistically what it's going to be. What was the date, payment number, 
and which bank accounts it goes to. If I click OK, when that particular transaction gets saved, it will then create a manual payment posting entry within the bank account and obviously against the particular creditor on that item. That will obviously also be taken into account when this purchase order becomes a GRN, then becomes an invoice, and it comes to payment one. One word of warning with regard to that is that will only work if you do not have analytical accounting, project accounting, or multi-dimensional analysis in use. <clears throat> save that. Okay, moving on to the sales ledger. I'm just going to bring up my cards. So once again, from a debtor perspective, I can once again attach documents. Well, this particular debtor, I have got a particular attachment on it. And again, I can print out a range of specific reports that I've wanted to assign to the debtor card. And again, I can set a default view and once again link it into any specific smart list favorites that I've created. One thing that's particularly handy now is if you are using multi-currency, you can apply cash at point of entry, whereas beforehand what you had to do was uh, put the cash receipt on the system, post it, then go in and apply it to uh, the invoice uh, after the posting. What you can now do is at point of entry, I'm going to put through a cash receipt for a USD supplier for one, two, three, four, five, six. You'll see now I can apply that directly to an outstanding invoice. Say you're having to post it, then go and apply it at a later date. From a sales perspective, those of you who do orders, you've always been able to transfer multiple orders to invoice using the bulk confirmation. What you now have is you now have the option within the bulk confirmation to create a combined invoice. So what that allows you to do is combine multiple orders onto a single invoice for the customer. And then uh, moving on to the last part, which uh, is bringing the business intelligence side of GP directly into the, the, the core use of it itself, is you get uh, Microsoft Analysis Cubes um, enabled as part of the standard GP 2013 product. Now, I'm going to do a very, very simple one. You get uh, out of the box, you have ones for receivables, payables, sales. Inventory, so on and so forth. So what I'm going to do is do a very, very simple one against the cube for payables. And these, as I said, just come straight out of the box. This is real-time data, and it's automatic refreshing. So if you want this for a specific user who doesn't have access to GP, it's ideal. I'm just going to do a straightforward pivot table, but you can do pivot table. Here we go. Right, so here is the pivot table. And all I'm basically going to do, these are straight out of the box. I can do it by company. So I've got two companies set up within GP. I want to have a look at total purchase amount and what's outstanding by company. And what I can do is I can double click and that will then return specific records for that particular. Alternatively, I want to have that as a filter. I'm going to change that to my Fabricam company. And what I'd like to do is bring in my customers. And there we go. Simple as that. And that's real time. I can double click and it shows each record for each one. I can add further if I wanted to group it by class. I can do. It's just a straightforward Excel pivot table. But the benefit you have is that the, 
the, the cube is automatically built for you. You could, again, if you want to do, rather than have a cube, you have a nice pretty picture. So I'm going to have a pivot table and report. So I'm going to have the total amount that I have in my sales ledger. And there's my aging buckets. And you see it's automatically created those for me. So it's a very, very simple way of creating an Excel-based dashboard. And that's just straight out of the box. If you know how to use pivot tables, those are automatically there. And it's just a case of figuring out what you want to have on there. And there you have it.